Spanish Lobby ARC Review Part 1, Episodes 264 to 268. Spandam is having a meeting with the other three members of CP9. Kumadori, who is some kind of giant samurai. Fukudo, who is... Well, his mouth is a zipper. And Jabura, who by comparison seems relatively normal. Meanwhile, we're treated to another Soga King opening theme song as Usopp tricks both Luffy and Chopper. Then Sanji explains Robin's buster call trauma to everyone else regarding the city of Ohara, not Ohana. Then Polly whips out a map of Venice Lobby and begins to explain the plan. The expendable Frankie brothers will go in first, and after five minutes, they'll get the gates open so the Mugiwara crew can charge in unopposed. Despite the official confirmation of the plan, Luffy launches himself into Ennis Lobby and begins his own interpretation of what he believes the plan was. Run around and beat people up until the goal is accomplished. The Frankie brothers encounter two giants who are guarding the gates. Non-evil Galley Law employees, Polly, Tileston, and Lulu arrive, and Gulliver's travels one of the giants so that they can continue on. Back with Spandam, the evil Galley Law employees, Luchi, Kaku, Khalifa, and Bruno, arrive with Robin and Frankie. Then we assess everyone's power levels. The average human is a 10 but CP9 is slightly above average. Khalifa is 630, and she's the weakest. Luchi is the strongest at 4,000, which is nearly twice as much as the second strongest, Kaku, who's 2,200. Well, the numbers make no sense, but regardless, I'm impressed. Spandam is so distracted by CP9 being drama queens that he doesn't even notice that his phone is off the hook so he can't get messages regarding the invasion. So the Marines turn to the three-headed Baskerville, which is a person, I think, with three heads that express both extremes and neutral. Then Polly is stabbed by dog-mounted forces. Luckily, that's when the Mugiwara crew steps in and flies Rocket Man right into the other giant's face. They emerge from the train and kick some ass. They jump on a giant Yagara with Polly and they head towards the CP9 headquarters. Polly, weren't you just stabbed a couple of minutes ago? No. I'm pretty sure you were. Oh, right, that's okay, I, I'm, I'm fine. Polly, Lulu, and Tileston will hold off the Marines as the Mugiwara crew continues on. And CP9 has no idea. Spandam is too busy beating up Frankie and Robin to even notice. And it's implied that maybe he has devil fruits in his possession. All in all, admittedly, kind of a slow start. Kind of rough. But I anticipate things will pick up. There's only so many scenes of the Mugiwara crew beating up faceless Marines I can tolerate before I say enough is enough. But that's okay, because I bet there's a lot more personalized action on the horizon. Well, and I guess I haven't talked about Spandam yet. But frankly, it's because he hasn't really done anything that would spark talking points yet. Sure, he's done a whole lot of stuff like the whole Tom situation and beating up restrained people. But what does that say about him besides he's an asshole? On the spectrum of One Piece villains, he's definitely up there with his behaviors and motivations and villainous activity. But we all know that he's only behaving in this way because he's in a position of power. It's painfully obvious that if he was left to fend for himself, he would fail miserably as a villain. If you stripped away his title, his henchman, and his buster call threat, I bet he wouldn't even appear on Luffy's radar. Weirdly, although Spandam is the head of CP9, I anticipate he's not the big bad. I think it might be Luchi. In this chunk of episodes, we learned of a method that we could check on CP9's power levels in order to rank them accordingly. Well, that's fine, I guess, but I don't know how terribly necessary it was. I think the vibes from the characters already provided us with the necessary power level assessments. Obviously, Luchi was the strongest by a lot, and obviously, Khalifa was the weakest. Because she's a woman. Fine. And now, because I'm me, I have to ask some technical questions about CP9. I understand the importance of Pluton, but why send four people, especially your two strongest, on one undercover mission? And I have issue with Kaku. He said he was 23, which means he was sent on this mission when he was 18, but he already had a previously established relationship with the other three members of CP9, which mean he joined CP9 when he was less than 18, so he was like 17 or 16. And only super strong people can join CP9, so that meant he started practicing the Rokushiki techniques when he was like 12. Do you see my issue here? 
And for an organization that supposedly doesn't exist, there's a lot of soldiers who know about them and are able to recognize them even though they've been missing for five years. In theory, I think CP9 was a good idea, but it was executed too lazily for me to overlook these inquiries. Anyway, there's a new opening theme song. I think it's really cute and catchy, and it brings back a lot of elements and characters that have been missing for a really long time. Like Whitebeard and Ace and Shanks and Smoker! Does this mean Smoker is gonna make his way to Ennis Lobby? We haven't seen him in forever! Not since he told his commanding officer to eat shit in the Alabasta arc 150 episodes ago! I expected they'd put him on hold for the Skypea arc, but this is just way too much. Also in the opening, we saw Zoro fighting Kaku and Sanji fighting Khalifa. Has he ever fought a woman before? I don't think he has, so I imagine that's going to be a challenge. There were a lot of other flashes of other things that are coming up in this arc that I don't have context for until I watch more. There is also a new cute little ending theme song that showcases art from what I assume as children who submitted it to the creator. Can you imagine being a nine-year-old whose sloppy depiction of Luffy is forever immortalized by this show? Ten years later, that's an awesome pickup line. Hey girl, did you watch the end of that episode 267 of One Piece because that second picture that popped up of Luffy doing gum gum no storm? I drew that. Mm, maybe not. What do you think about Iceberg aligning himself with the military so he couldn't be harmed by them? Pretty crafty. I have to admit, as I was watching the episodes, I was a little irked after Iceberg's past was revealed. I thought it was odd that someone with a nasty taste in their mouth regarding the government would ascend to a political position. But he did it to keep himself safe and to keep Pluton safe. And it's kind of interesting to see the vastly differing paths chosen by Frankie and Iceberg. Iceberg became mayor, united all the construction companies of Water 7, and also manages the sea train. Well, oppositely, Frankie basically sunk to the level of a common criminal. I suppose it might be because although they both lost Tom on that day, they don't feel the same degree of guilt. After all, Iceberg was a completely passive bystander before, during, and after the incident. While on the other hand, Frankie was quite active throughout its entirety. Plus, he supposedly died after the fact. And then he became a cyborg. It's interesting to see the way the two of them went about protecting their knowledge of Pluton. Next up, let's talk about how when the crew was approaching Ennis Lobby, they came up with a plan. And Luffy nodded approvingly at the plan. Yet, when it came time to execute the plan, Luffy did a completely different thing. My question is, did Luffy knowingly go against the plan, or was he confused and legitimately thought he was doing the correct thing? I think there is evidence to support both responses. Knowing Luffy's past, we accept that he gets confused easily, so he might have thought that part of the plan was that he had to charge in. However, we've also seen him in the past reject other people's plans and choose to do what he wanted. However, I don't think he's ever outright lied to his crew that he was gonna do one thing and then did the total opposite. Luffy isn't really the lying type. This is why I think Luffy was just merely agreeing to carry out the plan because he was confused by it. I don't think he actively determined that he was going to undermine the group's agreement. If there was any danger to anyone else, then Luffy would not have carried out his slight adjustment to the plan. Lastly, why is Polly fighting? I really don't know. Is it just for his honor and to get back at CP9 for fooling him for five years and also hurting Iceberg? Because he doesn't care about rescuing Frankie or Robin. He won't obtain anything from pitting himself against the world government. And while we're talking about Polly, I have to ask, why was he stabbed? Why is anyone in One Piece ever shot or stabbed? Is it just for the shock value? Because Polly gets stabbed and it's like, no! But then he comes back in the next scene like it never happened. I know it's a cartoon and they're just fighting through injuries, but getting stabbed is a huge deal. You don't just casually get that wrong. Iceberg was shot five times and then a sixth time and he went into a coma, but he was still able to get up and fix the sea train six hours later. Oh, I just have to stop bringing this up and get past it. I'm sorry. Now for the awards. Let's honorably mention the Frankie brothers. 
and Polly. Best pair goes to Sanji and Zoro for kicking ass. And while we're at it, why don't we give them the boss award for the same reason? Like some co-bosses. The triumphant moment is breaching the gate at last. The best burn was Zoro rubbing it in Sanji's face that he had a bounty and Sanji was just Kaizoku A. The WTF moment was Lulu's established hair gimmick poking out of Chopper. Best lol was Soga King. Always and forever, Soga King. The Oh Snap Award was when Polly told the Mugiwara crew to tell Luchi and Kaku that they're fired. Oh snap. The best injury was Polly getting stabbed even though he was fine two seconds later, but I'll try to appreciate the pain of getting stabbed. The best attack was when Luffy turned one of the Marines into a puppet and used him as a human shield punched people. I think it was called Gamu Gamu no Mikata no Roboto? The best fight was Luffy versus the Bountiful Gatekeepers. I think it was a fun display of skills despite its one-sidedness. The MVP was no one! Everyone's actions in this arc were basically interchangeable with one another, except for Luffy who ruined the plan. So if there was an LVP award then it would go to Luffy. LVP? I like that. The Anislavi arc, reportedly one of the most successful arcs in One Piece, is underway. So far, decent. Some of you have commented worrying about a couple of the recap episodes that happen in this arc. Thank you for the heads up and I have established my schedule accordingly. Take a look in the description for the details of my upcoming schedule and tell me if I've done it right. Up next I'll be watching episodes 269 and 270. So I'll see you then. Bye! But that's okay, because I bet there's a lot more personalized... Frankie is too busy beat... Frankie, no. It's Panem. Despite this official confirmation of the plan, Luffy launches himself into Ennis' lobby in direct opposition... No. Then Sanji explains Robin's buster hall... Hall. Back with Spandam, the evil Galila employees, Luchi, Kaku, Khalifa, and Bruno, arrived to... Then what? <laughs> it's too hard when there's... Ugh.